And he goes, he said, stay away from me. <laughs> and I said, uh, God's brought you here. He said, get, get out of here. Stay away from me. And then I grabbed his hand, and he grabbed mine and squeezed it, and he pulled me, drug me from the church. I mean, he pulled me, friend, like a mule train pulls a cargo. He pulled me out into, into the foyer and dragged me, just pulling me. And he, he backed, the, the women's restroom was right up in there. And she, he, he was just pulling me. And he backed up into that little cubby hole where you walk in the women's restroom. He was trapped. He was trapped. And right there. Right there. Right there, the Spirit of the Lord. Some of you don't believe in all this stuff. I want to tell you, friend, you better wake up. You better wake up. You better wake up to how Satan has got people bound in this nation. We began to cast out demons out of this man. He was totally set free. The next day, he burned. He, he gathered up four garbage cans. Is that right, four? Four of those big black garbage can bags full of witchcraft paraphernalia. This man was heavy into it, friend. Four big bags full and had a bonfire out in his backyard two years ago. You may be saying, well, what on, what on earth is he doing right now? Maybe he's bowing before the Lord, friend. I don't know. But I want to tell you, he's in Bible school, studying for the ministry. Well, Linda, we're going to go on. But I, one of the things that, that we have seen in this revival, see, the devil has messed up a lot of your lives. And he will, the Bible says that the Lord will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. This man has gone to the enemy's camp, and he's taken back what the devil took from him. Can we do that one more time? God bless you, man. Glory! Well, I went to the enemy.
everything that's got a hold of me, Lord. Jesus. Just speak your word. Your healing word I receive.
sickness. There's sickness of the mind, sickness of the spirit. But the biggest problem is sickness of the heart. People are heart sick because they put their hopes in things that have failed. They put their hopes in the American dream and it's built on pride. And the Bible says pride comes before destruction. They put their hopes in their family and the family lets them down. Put their hopes in friends and friends let them down. But when you're weary and you're worn and everything that you put your hopes in has failed you, people who are looking on at the revival like to say, everybody who goes to revival and goes to God for their help, they use him for a crutch. No, we don't. We realize that not only is he God, he's the great physician. While medical doctors and psychiatrists practice their art and their craft, he's not practicing. He's, he's mastered the craft. He knows how to take a cancerous lung and replace it with a new one. how to take an eye that has never seen the light of day and put mud in somebody's eye and say go wash and see and see and see he knows how to take the lepers of society he knows how to heal AIDS but most of all and more importantly he knows how to fix your heart He knows how to give you hope again. He knows how to make you smile again. The Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And a lot of people's got sick hearts. But I, when I found the Lord, I found healing. Ooh. And there's nothing too hard for God. No problem been created that He can't stop. to see I like this when I find you I find healing and when I find you I find peace peace of mind and I know that there's no river so wide no mountain so high no ocean so deep you can't part the
everybody's dancing now Cause we're so free If only we could see your face See you smiling over us Unseen angels celebrate Cause joy's in this place bless you. You may be seated. I'm going to read this, and I feel the anointing on me as I read this. The lights are on. A Dodge SKI-17W is your license plate. And, uh, boy, I feel the anointing on me when I read that, folks. Have no fear. Jesus is here. And I'm going to tell you something. I've discovered in this revival, God has no favorites, but he has intimates. He has those who are dissatisfied with religion, dissatisfied with church as usual, but hungry for more of Jesus. This revival is about Jesus. When I met the evangelist, the pastor, the infatuation with Jesus, Lindell, his infatuation with Jesus has changed my life. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. This revival is not about denomination, personality. It's not about a super-duper hotshot Houdini singer, evangelist, pastor. It's about, are you ready, the main attraction, the center of attention, the focus of our affection, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noontime. Jesus when the sun goes down. Yeah. All right. I love the gospel of John. There are degrees of relationship with God. There are those who follow far off, and there's the 70, then there's the 12, then there's the three. He taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and goeth up. And then there is John, the one who leaned upon his bosom. And in John's gospel, he gives us a pictorial view of who Jesus is. 
All he does, all 21 chapters, is brag on Jesus. In John chapter 1, the Word of God, Lamb of God, Son of God. Chapter 2, the Son of Man. Chapter 3, Jesus is the divine teacher. Nicodemus comes at night. Nick at night. And he comes at night. John chapter 4, Jesus is the soul winner. The woman comes with a water pot. She leaves with the well. Her life has changed. Chapter 5. Chapter 5, he's the great physician. I've got good news. Lyndall said it. I reiterate, when the doctor shakes his head, walks away from your bed, and says there is no hope, there is no cure for your malady, how many knows there is one who can walk into your life, mind, body, soul, spirit? Jesus. Chapter 6, he is the bread of life, wonder bread, never stale. Chapter 7, he's the water of life, satisfaction guaranteed. Chapter 8, they catch the woman in the very act of adultery. They drag her before Jesus. They've got rocks in their hand and rocks in their head. They won't have a rock concert. But Jesus is the defender of the weak. He never came to condemn or condone. He came to forgive. How many knows? That's good news. Chapter 9, he's the light of the world. I left a service like this years ago. A man met me with a cigarette and said, Hey, do you have a light? I said, I sure do. Amen. I begin to tell him. Chapter 10, the good shepherd. Chapter 11, the resurrection of the life. Chapter 12, the king. 13, the servant. 14, the great consoler. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. Lindell said it. How many knows he can heal your achy, breaky heart? Oh, yes, he can. Chapter 15, he's the true vine. Chapter 16, the giver of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 17, the intercessor. Chapter 18, the rejected Savior. Chapter 19, they call it Good Friday. It's a bad day. The worst day man's ever known. They shake their fist in God's face and beat his back and it's a bloody mango mass of jelly swollen to a pulp and he dies. And if the story ended there, all we would have would be a funeral dirge, slow walking, sad talking. How many knows that all footprints lead into a grave? But there is one set of footprints that leads out on the other side. He didn't stay in the tomb. He kicked the bottom out of the grave and he jumped up shouting, it's Easter. How many knows he's alive? His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. This revival's about Jesus. Woo! Hello? Woo! And I said that to say this. You see, a popular talk show host said the other day, said, I believe in God, said, but I don't believe there's just one way to God. She said, there's many ways to God. Well, how many knows Jesus stood emphatically, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so I wrote a poem. It goes something like this. Buddha, Hare Krishna, and Muhammad can never save a sin-sick soul. To do this, it'll take someone greater than Bud, Harry, and Mo. Say amen, somebody. And Sung Young Moon is not the way, though he claims to be the one. To find the way, you must go past the moon if you want to get to the sun. Buddha, Hare Krishna, and Muhammad are still dead in the grave. But Jesus Christ is risen in power and mighty to save. Yes, Jesus Christ is alive, his grace and glory to show. So keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and forget Bud, Harry, and Mo. It gets worse, folks. Please hold your applause. The dream of Joseph Smith is not the truth, it's a myth. He's myth-informed and myth-led, and of old men, both mithrable and dead. How many knows they're all dead, but Jesus is alive? This revival is to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. Steve, pastor, I've never in my life seen anything like I saw a few days ago with the team in Dallas, Texas. Now, folks, I'd pay $5,000 to get to go to see what I saw. As Steve gave the altar call both nights, and Paul Wetzel told us this, he said, we still rejoice on the day of Pentecost, rightly so, but we're not to worship that day. Jesus said, there's a greater day coming. There was 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost. I saw Friday night. Our Music played during the offering. Uh, I'm uh, not going to sing, though. Steve suggested I pray about it, and I got a quick answer. So I won't be singing a cappella. Um, some of you know my testimony. Um, I was saved in 1971 as a heroin shooting Jewish rock drummer in a very logical place. If you were God, where would you send a rebellious, proud, heroin-shooting, LSD-using, ungodly Jewish rock drummer? To a little Italian Pentecostal church in Queens, New York. <laughs> that's where God saved me, so unfortunately, if I want to express myself musically, I've got to do it behind the drums, but I don't feel a witness to do a drum solo either, so 
Uh, I just want to talk to you about a couple of things. Uh, just um, as the offering comes by, you can respond. Otherwise, just focus this way. You know, when you read the Scriptures, you'll see that when God is moving, crowds are never an issue. You don't have to work hard to draw crowds when God is moving. And much of what the church in America has done for years is to try to make up for the absence of the presence and power of God. A lot of what we do, a lot of our programs, a lot of our methodology is simply a human effort to make up for lack of anointing, lack of the presence of God, lack of the power of God. We have what I always refer to in America as microwave ministry. We want instant results with no preparation. We don't want to go the way of the cross or the way of consecration, the way of waiting on God for God to move in power. So we come up with a method. We come up with a plan. And the plan and the method may draw people, but it will not change lives for the glory of God. And where it brings change, it is only superficial change. When you look in the Scriptures and look at the ministry of John the Baptist, he was not what you would call politically correct. He was not what you would call seeker-sensitive. He was not what you would call an ear tickler. He preached repentance, but he preached it in the anointing and power of God, and the crowds came from everywhere. And there were no miracles and healings, and yet they came from everywhere. And when John Wesley was asked how he drew the crowds, he said, I set myself on fire, and the people come to watch me burn. Friends, when we depend on God, when we recognize our need, and revival only comes when we recognize our need first. See, if we think we're filled and we have it all and our churches are doing great and our Sunday school is overflowing and our business is fine and our marriage is fine, and what do we need revival for? Then we're not candidates. We're so filled with ourselves, we're not candidates. Jesus said to the church of Sardis, you have a reputation for being alive and yet you're dead. He said, wake up. Until there's a waking up in the heart, there's not going to be a hunger for revival. The church in Laodicea said of itself, we're rich, we're increased in goods, we have need of nothing, we've got it made. Maybe they were the fastest growing church in Asia Minor. Maybe they had the biggest budget in Asia Minor. Maybe they had the best known speakers. Maybe they had some of the local politicians and musicians in their church. We're rich, increased in goods, have need of nothing. Jesus said, you don't realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold tried in the fire. When you recognize your need, all the human methods, all the human efforts, all the human work won't do the work of God. When you recognize that, you become a candidate for revival. You fall to your knees and you say, God, you've got to send the rain because we're dry and thirsty. You fall to your knees and you say, God, you've got to change my life because I'm falling short. And you see, we like to be in control. We like to be in control and make things happen. I, I talk, forgive the cliche, but I talk about our fast food faith that produces biodegradable believers. And we've got it. We're so full of it in America. How do we make it happen? What's the new seminar? What's the new button to push? I tell you, the button to push is get on your knees, get the sin out of your life, and cry out to God for holy visitation, and do what he gives you to do, and don't st stop seeking and knocking and asking until the glory comes down. That's the answer. That's the key. Evan Roberts said, a church on its knees is irresistible. Let me just say this to you. If you could develop a cure for cancer, and this one pill cost $10,000, but it would cure all forms of cancer permanently just by swallowing this one pill. Friends, you would not need a multi-million dollar advertising campaign. You could price that at $100,000. And the fact is you would not be able to make them quickly enough. You'd have people trying to break into the factory to steal it. And everybody trying to copycat the formula. At any cost, at any price, could they have to get it? If we saw one-tenth of the people born blind, miraculously and instantly healed, we wouldn't be able to keep away the crowds. And friends, when people come to the house of God and leave transformed, when they come, because people around here know what happens. Police officers in the area testify to what happens to people in the revival. Educators know about it. People come from around the country. Why? Because they heard that somebody met God and they were changed. And you didn't stand online all day 
just to come here and, and sing for a little while, you could have stayed at home and listened to a tape. You didn't come here just to say you've done it. You could just order a t-shirt that says, been there, done that, you know? And you didn't stand here all day just to come to a meeting at the end to have someone pray for you. Someone says, well, they just push the people over. That's right. People come from around the world, stand online all day to have someone push them over. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Speaks very well of your intelligence. And by the way, if you came that far, just have someone push you over, save your money, stay home, stand by the bed, and let someone push you over on the bed. <laughs> now, you came because you know someone whose life was changed by God. You saw God do what nobody else could do. You came because you heard a testimony or because you yourself found a hunger in your heart that could only be satisfied by the presence of the living God, and you heard that God was moving here. We had a man baptized the other day who kept talking about God bringing him to Brownsville, Texas and saving his life. He didn't even realize he was in Brownsville, which is a neighborhood in Pensacola. He was talking about Texas. We've had people come from New Zealand and Germany come around the world to come here to get saved, figure it out. We had a woman get baptized a few months ago, a new ager from Sacramento, California who heard that God was in Pensacola. And she got on the plane, and instead of just hearing a message of, do you feel it? Isn't he wonderful? She heard a message of repent, get the sin out of your life, only one way, the blood of Jesus, and she was saved. Yes. So let me encourage you, friends. There are no tricks. There are no gimmicks. It's the power of God setting people free through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's holy living that opens up the heavens for God to pour out His Spirit. And I would encourage you again, as I said last night, get absolutely everything you can get from God while you're here. And let Him dig deep. If the surgeon says, listen, we can do a partial surgery and get half the cancer out, and, and we can do it in half the time, with half the recovery period, or we could operate twice as long, the recovery period is twice as long, but we will get every last trace of cancer out. You say, get it all out, doctor. Get it all out. Friend, let God dig deep. You may have been at this altar repenting of something last night, and God puts his finger on something else. We've had people come up three, four times, and then they'll write us six months later, I am absolutely changed. And all the things I repented of, I left at this altar, and I'm free. I'll give you this last testimony. A man came in here who had been an alcoholic for 40 years. Such an illustrative testimony. Alcoholic for 40 years. He was in the armed services. He said, I tried every kind of program to get free, and I couldn't get free. He said, then I realized alcohol was not my problem. Disobedience to God was my problem. He said, and I dealt with it at those altars. And I said to him, how long, this is months and months later, I was asking him this question, how long did it take you to get free? He said, right there at those altars. When he nailed the problem to the cross, sin, and he died to it, he got up free and changed. Let God dig deep, friends. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, God's laid it on my heart to speak on the holiness of God. One of the foundations of revival, one of the foundational things that God does in us is to produce holiness of heart. This is especially a session for all those in leadership and ministry. We do these every Friday, full-time Christian workers, ministers, ministry staff, but it's open to others that want to come as well. But in particular, this is for leaders. Others are welcome to come. We'll be talking about the holiness of God. That's at 11 o'clock. If you're in youth ministry, we have a special meeting with Richard Crisco. This will be in the choir room in this building at 10 in the morning. If you're in youth ministry, to have your questions on youth ministry answered. If you're in children's ministry, also at 10 o'clock in the morning here, in the cafeteria, you can meet with Pastor Van Lane, our children's pastor. And across the street in the chapel, <coughs> excuse me, there'll be a youth meeting, our normal youth service that we're having in the summer for all teens and hungry young people across the street in the chapel at 10 in the morning, and then our session in here at 11 on the holiness of God. So come with an open heart. The Lord will meet you richly. Grab a brochure in our school of ministry on the way out. Uh, God's called us to raise up a school to train laborers for the harvest with an uh, emphasis on missions and the work of the Lord. So we invite you to take one of the brochures and find out about the school. God bless you, Pastor.
How many of you tonight are here for the very first time? Can we see your hand, please? Very first time. Wow. Stand up if you're here for the first time. All over. All the buildings. Wow. Let's just get... Uh, I'll tell you what. While we're doing this, just remain standing. Those of you that just did remain standing. I'm going to ask everybody that's from outside the United States... I'm going to ask in all the buildings, if you will leave where you are and come here in the main sanctuary and just begin to line up along the wall over here. Come this way. We're, going to, we're just going to follow you across the platform. Let everybody stand here at one time, and we're going to find out where everybody's from. So if you're from outside the United States, file in this way and come all the way across the platform. Keep standing. Where are you folks from back there? Are you, are you a bus? Are, are you, did you come on a bus? Huh? Oklahoma? What part? All right. Where are you folks from? Michigan. Let's just get some samplings of where people are from. Over here. Alabama. All right. Houston. Huh? Mobile. All right. Are right you? Oklahoma. Kentucky. Alberta. All right. Right here. St. Louis. Back here. Canada? Back in the back. Texas? Right here. Sacramento? Right in here. Africa? Okay. Right here. Texas? Right here. Ohio? Back in the back? Huh? All right. Back here in the back. Back in the back. Where are you from? All right. All right. South Carolina. Nashville. New York. South Carolina. Alabama. All right. Up in the balcony. Texas. All right. One more time. Hollywood, Florida. Okay. Over here. All right. Up there. All right, up here. Louisiana. All right, how many of you are here tonight, and this is your last night or tonight is your first time at Revival? Stand up, please. Last night or tonight is your first night at the Revival. Last night or tonight. Come on, stand up. Last night or tonight is your first time. How many of you here tonight, and this, this is not your home church. Brownsville is not your home church. Stand up. If this is not your home church, look at this. Can you see what would happen if Brownsville Assembly tried to come to revival? <laughs> Brownsville fills up this church every Sunday, and they have to have tickets to get in their own church. And we open the doors up and from 9.15 to 9.40 for our people to come and get in their church on Sunday mornings. After 9.40, then the visitors can get in, and then we put them in the other buildings also. But you can tell tonight that just about everybody here is from somewhere else, and this is not their home church. Now, while they're continuing to gather from those outside the country and even here in the building, if you will, please just go ahead and make your way over. If you're from outside the country, even if you came up last night, that's fine. We want to just have you come up here and stand for just a moment. Everybody else can be seated. All right. From all the buildings, we want you to come over. I think that probably some of you that thinks that you came up last night, you shouldn't come tonight, but go ahead and come on anyway. Come on. If you came up last night, go ahead and come on. And all the buildings come quickly. Go ahead and start filing this way. Just come up here and stand with me, stand along the steps. We want to just get an idea of where everybody's from. From all the buildings, come quickly. Help us out up here. John, help us out, brother. Take them all the way down, even on the steps over there, so they can just spread out. Come on this way. Come on this way. Just stack them. That's right. Go ahead. If you're in other buildings, come right on.
Everybody in all the buildings, come quickly. We're going to find out where you're from. If you want to, you can just sort of move on the steps down there. Just sort of stand on the steps a little bit. Just move that way just a little bit so we get some more up here. There we go. Just step right on down on the steps. Step right on down on the steps, a few of you. There you go. Come right on down. There you go. That'll open it up a little bit more. If you could do some DNA tests on our carpet, and on our pews, you would find hair samples from all over the world. <laughs> all over the world. <clears throat> these, uh, these are the few of the people that have come from our international guests from all over the world. And I'm going to name some countries, and as I name the country, if you will, just raise your hand if you're from there. Uh, let's start off with uh, Canada, all right? England, Australia, all right? New Zealand, Japan, <laughs> Korea, Korea. Uh, let's see, uh, we had one here last night from Ethiopia. Are you still here? There you are. God bless you. Ethiopia. Uh, Latin American countries. Mexico, all right. Let's see, what's some I didn't name? If you're here and I haven't named your country, yes. Israel, all right. Yeah. All right, some other countries I have a name. Back in the back. South Africa. All right. Yeah. Sweden. All right. Norway. Hey, Denmark. You guys are going to be getting married, aren't you? When are you getting married? One year. You sure? Hey, brother. I just feel like you need to get married before a year goes by. <laughs> How many of y'all feels that way? Yeah. What do you say? What do you say? Huh? Marry him now? Hey, all right. Hey. Charlie, bring me my book. I'll do this. We'll handle this right now. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is your face red or sunburned? <laughs> Any other countries I haven't named yet? Over here. Huh? Wales, okay. I, I'm, I'm past 40. I don't hear as good as I used to. How did you say that? Come here and say that for everybody. How did you say that? I don't say it like that. Wales. Yeah. Wales. You know what I say? Whales. <laughs> Say it one more time. Whales. Yeah. All right. Have we got anybody here tonight from Ireland? Ireland. Huh? Germany? All right. We got anybody here from Ireland? What about Scotland? Scotland. Come here, brother. Tell everybody how you say Scotland. Oh, you're English. Well, how do they say it in Scotland? Bonnie Scotland. Hey! What about somebody from Australia? Australia. Is he a good one? Can he say it right? Can you say it good, brother? What do you want me to say? What do you think they say in Australia? Uh, g'day, mate. Is it hey! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anybody else we had to call out your country? Huh? Cayman Islands, Philippines, Finland, all right, Finland, yeah. Panama, 
Argentina, all right, yeah. Huh? Ukraine, wow. That's a long way from home. Up here? Slovakia, wow. Barbados? Huh? Mexico, all right. Yeah. Ukraine? Hong Kong, China, wow. Well, tell me, what brings, what brings somebody here to Pensacola, Florida, from Hong Kong, China? Very few people in Hong Kong knew about um, the revival in Pensacola, but I, I happen to know, and um, I, I, I knew that a group of pastors, they wanted to come. And um, since I will come to America, they say, go and see yeah. and prepare our way. Well, praise God. Let me ask you, um, there's, a group, there's a group of pastors in, in China that wants to come to Pensacola to the revival? Uh, Hong Kong. Yeah. From Hong Kong. Yes. And they wanted you to come and see what it's all about and prepare the way? What do you think it would cost to bring that group of pastors here? You mean individually or the whole group? The whole group. We're talking about, thir about 30 pastors from different denominations. From China? Uh, yeah, Hong Kong now is part of China. So each one of them, airfare, accommodation, uh, maybe about 15,000 Hong Kong, 2,000 US per person. So it'd be about $60,000 to get them over here. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know what? Maybe we can help a little bit with that as a church. <clears throat> I'll tell you what you do. I'll tell you what you do. You go back, you get my address tonight before you leave here, you get our address, and you write me back in English. <laughs> write me back and let me know how many cannot afford to come, how many, you know, just really can't afford it. And we'll see what we can do about trying to raise some money to get them here. How's that? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Let's give everybody a big hand. Come on. Give them all a big hand. You can be seated. How many of you up here in the choir is from Brownsville? Come here just a minute. Yeah, come here. Let me have another one or two. Which one's from Brownsville? Come here, sweetheart. The blonde-headed lady, yeah, come here. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, we have so many new people here at the church, I hadn't learned all their names yet. I'm from Brownsville. You from Brownsville? No. All right. <clears throat> Let's have a man from Brownsville. Where's one of the men? Come here, brother. I'm from yeah. Brownsville. I said a man. <laughs> Lendl, <clears throat> you still remind me of a boy. Because you're so lighthearted, man. You dance, and you're just so lighthearted. You're not saving it. <laughs> I love you, man. Well, listen, you guys that are here from Brownsville, what do you think whenever you see all these people coming in like that from all over the world to this church, to your church? What do you think about that? Well, I'm very thankful that they come, that their hearts are real hungry for Jesus. Yeah. People from all around the globe that winds up here at your church where you go, I know your heart has to just burst with, with uh, not, not pride, but that God is doing something here and people want to come here and get what is going on. Bless them. I just want to bless them. Yeah. yeah. You want to bless them? Yes. 
We may be taking up an offering for those people from Hong Kong, so you may have an opportunity to bless them. <laughs> Hi. How you doing? What do you think about that? I just think it's totally awesome. People coming from all over the world. And what do you do for a living? Real estate. You're real estate. And you've been coming here for several years now, yeah. And uh, what brought you to the revival? Seeking God. Yeah. You were hungry. Just hunger for God. When you come here night after night, and I've seen you here a good bit, but when you come here night after night and you see all these people waiting outside in the line, what kind of talk do you all hear around Pensacola? Do you hear people talking about the lines out there and people sitting through thund thunderstorms and hot sun? What, what kind of talk do you hear? I, I couldn't answer that really, <laughs> Pastor, as far as the lines go. I don't know. I just know that everyone is hungry and um, that they're willing to wait in lines. I know when I drive by the church in the middle of the day and I look out and I see the big line and all the umbrellas and the coolers, to me it's as if if you could see on the other side, it would be the beach because that's what the scene looks like. Everybody, you know, it's just they're all lined up waiting to get into to the Lord's house, but it just looks like the beach. They're just there from the crack of dawn until, until sunset, I mean, until you let, let them in. Tonight we saw a, a newsletter from a Baptist church where a pastor said that <clears throat> he didn't necessarily agree with the charismatic doctrine, but he said we can sure learn a lot by driving by and seeing people standing outside waiting to get in that Assembly of God church out there. <laughs> what... Uh, when you see people driving by, well, when you drive by and you see those people out there, what do you think when you see that? I cry because I'm blessed. I know I'm blessed. The first time, I've, I've told the church here a number of times, but the first time that, we ever, that I ever saw a bus pull up out here out front and unloaded people, I, I was with my wife and I, I broke down and started crying. I remember whenever people started coming here from all, uh, first they started coming like Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and then here, you know, in Florida. But then whenever they began to come from nine states, and then 15 states, and 30 states, I just couldn't believe it. And then when I began to see buses pull up outside, I, I just broke down and cried that God was doing something and people were so hungry. Today, ladies and gentlemen, We've got a nation that is desperately hungry for the things of God. And I want to tell you something. It sure behooves us that whenever they come, there better be the real thing going on here. Because, you know, God's not in the business of hoodwinking people. We better have the real thing. And if there wasn't the real thing going on here, people can come in and smell a skunk. They know when something is uh, contrived by man, and they know when God's doing a work. But thank God... He's bringing the people here, and God is doing a work. Amen. Stand to your feet, please. <clears throat> Thank you.
Remain standing, if you would. Those of you, I know we're totally over capacity tonight. Sorry about that. We don't know what to do about the crowds. We just don't know what to do. It's just crowded. <laughs> and if you, I want to, no matter, no matter where you are on this campus, it makes absolutely no difference. God will touch you if you're in the back room, if you're in the hallway. One of my favorite stories is when I was walking down the hallway and I saw this girl just as happy as a lark and she was, had a chair underneath a speaker in the hallway and I walked up to her and I said, what's your name? She gave me her name and, and I said, do you come here often? She said, no, this is my first time. And she was so happy and um, I said, well, where are you sitting? She goes, right here. And she was in the hallway under a speaker in a chair and she was so thrilled that she was in the building, friend. I guarantee you, God bless that woman. Your attitude has a lot to do with it, so no matter where you're at, if you're in the back room, no, it doesn't matter where you're at, just rejoice. God is in the house. He will bless you. He will touch you tonight. Glory. Yes, He will. He will. I want everyone to pray with me the same prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. Everyone in this place, whether you're a God lover or a God hater, and I want to invite those of you, maybe there's some witches and warlocks here from New Orleans or downtown Pensacola, we welcome you. We want to thank you for coming. We ask that you in just... Please remain quiet during the service. Listen to the Word of God. Even if you've come to mock, please pay respect to a public meeting. Uh, you are not behind this pulpit. I am. So keep your mouth shut during the service. This is not your turn. It's your turn to listen. Okay, that's why you're here. I want everyone to pray the same prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. Everyone pray out loud with me right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name, In your precious name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Glory. You'll hear a lot of noises in these revival meetings like, like, woo! <laughs> and you'll hear, shoo! <laughs> 
And don't ask me what those noises are, friend. I just... I was praying with some folks one night, and I was so tired, and we just prayed for... I, I know I prayed for a thousand people that night, and I was just going along, and I just... Sometimes you just feel the presence of God all over the place, and I just... I went, woo, like that. And this, this one woman, she said, what does that mean? I said, man, I don't know, lady. And then I just kept praying for folks, and I went, shoo. She goes, what did that mean? I said, it meant shoo. I don't know what it means. There's just an excitement here, friend. God's moving. He's changing lives. And uh, we just rejoice. And so quit, trying, quit being so spiritual. I'm serious. Be, just back off and enjoy yourself and quit trying to analyze. You wear yourself silly trying to analyze everything. Some of you are already fine, with a fine-tooth comb. You picked apart this service, and you're, you're missing God. Let me tell you a story, something that happened to me one time that would fit real well right here for those of you that have come to just, you know, analyze it. I was in a revival meeting, and there was this healing evangelist that, that God was mightily using. And uh, God taught me a lesson during this revival meeting. I want you to hear it. There's about three or 400 people there, and I was sitting... Uh, if I could use this church as an example, uh, I was sitting about right where these, these folks are, right in here. And this healing evangelist got up there and, and was about to start his, do his thing. And um, my wife had, and I, I, this is back when three-piece suits were popular in the vest, and my wife had pinned up the vest in the back with safety pins, okay? A bunch of safety pins right up the back of the suit. And, um, and so that's how it was held together back there with those safety pins. And so, uh, and of course it was covered with the coat so no one ever knew it looked just fine. And I sat, when I sat down, one of the pins popped open and, and went right into my back. It drew blood. It went right into my back and I went, ow! <laughs> Everybody stared at me, including the evangelist. And this is what he did. He said, you brother! You have a back problem. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and I was turning every shade of red. But he didn't, let, he didn't let up on that. He goes, stand to your feet. So, so I stood up. He goes, Make your way out here, brother. God's going to touch you tonight. So, so I walk in front of 400 people. And this, this guy, he's a legitimate man of God. God's mightily using him. But you've got to understand, people are human. Okay, get, get man off the high horse, friend. God's on the throne. Okay, and so I walk up there and he goes, he goes, I want to pray for you that God would heal your back. So he lays his hands on my forehead. He goes, in the name of Jesus, I pray for healing. Heal this back, Jesus. Take away this pain, God. Healing in the name of Jesus. He said, go back to your seat. Boy, God's touched your life. So I went back and sat down, and, and I, I sat down and went, because, you know, it was over. No, I don't think so, friend. <laughs> At the end of the meeting, it was testimony time. <laughs> And he had prayed with all kinds of folks, and there was all kinds of legitimate things going on, but no, he had to pick on me. He goes, he goes, brother, you, yeah, stand up to your feet. And I stood up, and I said, and I said to, my, to, to the Lord, just in my spirit, I said, Jesus, I will not lie. You better direct this man's questions. <laughs> See, he brought me up in front of everybody, and he said, brother, Did you have a back problem a few minutes ago? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Did you have a pain in your back? <laughs> yes, sir. See, I'd already, I'd already closed the pen, and, and it, he said, Is that pain gone? I said, Yes, sir. And then he goes, Give God praise. <laughs> and the whole place went, Yay! <laughs> So I went back down to my seat and I sat down and whew. But you know, I learned something from that, friend. This man is an awesome evangelist. 
mightily used of God. He just, he sort of missed it, you know, it was just, but he really, you know, I did have a back problem. I did have a pain, but as one of those things, I could have, you know, I could have said, brother, you've missed it tonight, you know, that was a pen sticking in my back, and I could have sort of made a fool of the man. But you know, what's the purpose in all of that? It's like somebody comes here to the revival and somebody prays for you. Okay, I read a story about one lady said she was pushed over in the revival. Let me tell you something, friend. Nobody's going to push me over. Who's going to push you over? I mean, to push somebody over, you're going to have to go, wham, push them over. You know, if somebody push, if you fall over and, and some, it's not God, that's your business. That's not our business, okay? You lay a hand on somebody like this. One lady said somebody laid a hand on me and, and I moved backwards and then I moved backwards again and, and I just had to fall over because uh, that's, I just had to fall over backwards. And no, you didn't. No, you didn't. And, and so you can take something so, so uh, silly as that and you can, you can miss a move of God. You say, well, I know somebody, you know, that was prayed for at Brownsville and nothing really happened. There's people that come in here with their intellect and leave with their intellect. There's people that come in here with their heart and leave transformed. You come in here with your mind trying to figure everything out, friend, you'll leave out the same way you came in. But I just want to warn you about some little things like that. I could have let that one incident ruin my life with that evangelist. But it didn't ruin my life. Matter of fact, the next night I went back, the night after that, the night after that, some of the people I was with, God mightily touched their lives. He blessed me. God blessed me through the man. Or I could have gone, what a, what a shyster. What kind of man is that, you know? Missed God in pointing me out like that. Back off, friend. You hear me? Just back off. We're human beings. We're human beings. If you think somebody's pushing on you tonight, just look at them and say, hey, listen, uh, you know, I feel like that's a little bit too much pressure on my forehead. Our workers are lovely men and women of God. They'll go, hey, listen, I'm sorry. They're not here to push people over. And I tell them, as a matter of fact, my goal is for no one to fall over. We don't have any carpet room. If you fall over, it better be God, friend, because we're out of room. And falling over doesn't mean anything anyhow. Although it's wonderful. It doesn't make you more spiritual than the next guy. The bottom line is, are you open to Jesus? Well, get your Bibles. It's awfully early, but I am going to preach. Okay, thank you. I'll give you your 10 bucks later, brother. This is entitled, Don't Come Any Closer. Don't come any closer. I would like to speak for a few minutes tonight on an area that most of us will be able to relate to. There are many of us in this room and in other rooms tonight who have allowed the Lord a certain measure of freedom in your life. You have allowed the Lord to do a little bit, but you have limited Him in going all the way. Some of you are already bothered. I can feel it. Those are called the arrows of the Lord that you feel, friend. I remember one night, and as this message goes on, it's going to hit hard. Some of you are going to get hard because you've been limiting God in your own personal life. One night I was praying over in this area at the end of the service, and this little punk rocker uh, was, was waving at me over there, and he goes, he goes, preacher, you're the preacher, aren't you? You're the preacher. And I said, yeah, I'm the preacher. And he goes, he goes you were looking at me all night, weren't you? <laughs> I said, No. He goes, yeah, you were. You knew all about my life. I said, I don't know you. Do I know you? He goes, no, but you are talking to me. <laughs> you know what that is, friend? That's the arrows of God. He'll hit a bullseye every time. And the preacher can be preaching from this platform, and a man on this side over here could be under conviction, a woman in the back could be under conviction, a man walking down the hallway, going to the restroom, could fall under conviction. Why? The Lord, you can't hide from Jesus. And so when I spoke, even that first paragraph that I read to you, don't come any closer, that there are many of us in this room and in other rooms tonight who have allowed the Lord a certain measure of freedom in our lives but have limited him in going all the way. Some of you have already been hit by the arrow of the Lord. Now, we're going to read a scripture in just a minute. I feel in my spirit that God is about to touch hundreds of lives, but he will only and only 
if you submit yourself to his authority. The Lord has spoken these words to me. Steve, tell them that I love them. Tell them of my infinite love, how I paid the final sacrifice for their sins, how I did not slack off concerning my promises, but I went all the way to Calvary in order to secure their salvation. Tell them this is love. Lyndall just sang about it. Let them know I have a perfect plan for their lives, one of which they could not possibly dream or imagine that my plan was laid out before the foundation of the world, that I knew each and every one before they were born, that I foresaw all the struggles, I knew of the difficulties, and went so far as permitting them to come in order to draw them to my side. Tell them I have brought them to this point for a purpose. There is more. You must understand there is more to your relationship with God than what you've experienced. Let them know, the Lord spoke to me, that the majority of their present struggles are due to not allowing him total freedom in their lives. They have allowed me total access to some areas and have limited access to others. I will not settle, saith the Lord, for partial ownership. It's all or nothing. Turn with me to John chapter 6. I'm going to read several scriptures, not lengthy ones, but from different, several different spots in the Word of God. John chapter 6. I find it interesting in the Holy Scriptures that John 666 is this heavy scripture here. John 6, 6, 6. Jesus had been feeding the multitude. Jesus had been healing the multitude. Jesus had been working wonders. Heal my mama. Heal my brother. Feed my tummy. Give me water. I'm thirsty. Do this. Do that. Raise my dead son. Do this, Jesus. He had done it all, friend. He worked the works of his father. He worked miracles. But then he said this. And he's saying this tonight to the religious world. I'm sick of all of it, folks. I'm sick of your temples. I'm sick of your stained glass. I'm sick of your mauve carpet. I'm sick of all your chandeliers. I'm sick of it all, church. And he's saying this. Drink my blood and eat my flesh or you have no part of me. And when he said that, everybody was shocked. They said, this is too difficult. Verse 66 of John chapter 6, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Don't get any closer, Jesus. You've come far enough. I can handle the free meals, and I love it when you dish out bread and heal my mother and heal my son, and work miracles, but stop right where you're at. What are you talking about drinking your blood and eating your flesh? What is this cross life you're talking about? Pick up my cross and follow you. What on earth do you expect out of me? I'm here to tell you, friend, he expects a lot out of you. Look in the book of Acts. I was going to turn to a couple Old Testament scriptures, but I'm not going to tonight. Acts 26. A familiar scripture. Verse 27, this is Paul talking to King Agrippa. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Acts 26, verse 27. I know that you do. And Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these change. Here's what, he, here's what King Agrippa was saying to Paul. I like what you're talking about. You've done good, Paul, but hold it. Don't come any closer. You're getting to me. In a short while, you will persuade me to be a Christian. Be gone with you. Learn, turn, just flip a couple pages back to Acts 24. I'm telling you the scriptural precedence for what I'm speaking on tonight. It's in the Bible. 
Verse 24 of Acts 24. But some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 25. And as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened, and he said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. He was saying to Paul, don't get any closer. You remember the story of the rich young ruler. And he said, Jesus, I've done this and I've done that. I've, I've obeyed this commandment and that commandment. I've done all these things. And Jesus said, sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. Whoops. Too close. Too close. The Bible said the man turned and walked away sorrowful. He turned away from Jesus. And some of you, friend, tonight, I want you to pay attention for the next few minutes. Some of you have said that very thing to God. Don't come any closer. Keep your distance. Well, he ain't going to do that, friend. He'll either leave or get his way. Don't come any closer. Let me give you a few points tonight. One of them, one of the ways that you say to the Lord, don't come any closer, has to do with your salvation experience. You say to the Father, you say to Jesus, you say to the Holy Ghost, don't come any closer concerning your salvation experience. Some of you, friends, are so close yet so far away. There are some here who have never known the Lord, and you've limited God by not believing he can save you. Perhaps it's easy for you to see God forgiving others, but you can't imagine him forgiving you. Regardless of who you are, regardless of your background, regardless of your previous religious experience, Jesus Christ can save you and set you free tonight but some of you are saying he can't do it in my life he won't do it in my life it's okay for him to save your wife it's okay for him to save your son and your daughter maybe tonight your son and your daughter are across the street in the youth meeting with Richard Crisco there's a thousand teenagers over there going after God tonight maybe you're going good it's good for Betty it's good for Sue it's good for little Johnny and Bill but not me don't come any closer, God, concerning my salvation experience. Friend, you better stay with me tonight. This is serious. You must believe that your name is included in God's list, his list of potential candidates for salvation. God wants to save you, friend. He wants to set you free. There's some people. Is, is Joseph with us tonight? Where are you at, buddy? Stand up. Joseph, my buddy Joseph. Yeah, come on, stand up, brother. I want to tell you something. First, I want to tell you I love you. I want to tell you something else, buddy. God brought you here. How many days ago? About 10, something like that. 20? A couple weeks now. You want to know why? You're on his list, man. He loves you so much, man. And you know what you said to God a couple weeks ago? Maybe all your life. Now, you've been stoned all your life, haven't you? You've been sober for a while now. God's, God's been working on you. Let me tell you something. The Lord was turned off from you for years. I'm sure people tried to hand you tracks, tried to talk with you on the streets, tried to minister to you, and you turned them away. But two weeks ago, you said to Jesus, Rather than say, don't come any closer, two weeks ago you took your hands down and you said, Jesus, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. <laughs> Buddy, God bless you. You sit down. Let me tell you something. Don't come any closer concerning my salvation experience. Some of you have been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting God. Joseph Justice that stood a few, few minutes ago, for two years he's been saved now. But the time before that, friend, he fought God. He fought God constantly. And he was saying concerning his salvation experience, I'm a homosexual, God. You're not going to get a hold of me. You can't get a hold of me. I'm into witchcraft. I'm deep in it. Let me tell you something. Anybody that can come up with four full trash can bags full of witchcraft paraphernalia, they're into it. They're not dabbling, friend. They've dove in. 
They're into it. So Joseph, you could have been like that, friend, and said, God, you're never going to get a hold of me, but one day, two years ago, friend, you went, okay, come on. Come on. When you drop those barriers, friend, God can move in your life. He can change you. I remember when it happened in my life 22 years ago, I dropped those barriers. I was one of those that would curse Christians. I would curse those that followed God. I hated Christianity. I had anything to do with religions. But one day, that wall came down. Some of you are just like that, friend. You're saying, don't come any closer, Jesus. Don't come any closer. Well, tonight, friend, he's in your face. Tonight, he has come all the way up to your front door. He's knocked it. He's knocked on it. He's turned the doorknob, and he's opened it up, friend. He's right there in your face. Don't come any closer. It's too late, friend. He's here. Glory. Well, I'm going to do something tonight. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, I just want to cover some folks in this place tonight. I feel I'm supposed to do this. Let me tell you why. Because some of you in this room believe you ain't good enough to get saved. Well, welcome to the crowd. None of us are. We're all pond slime. We're all scum. We're all nothing. We're dirt balls. But somehow, by the glory of of God and the mercy and grace of God, he looked down and he saw you, sir, whether you're a millionaire or a pauper, and he said, I think I'll save that clown. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me tell you who whosoever is. How many want to hear it? Whosoever is everybody, anybody, everyone, him, her, them, they. Oh, those of you that are translating this in other languages, forget it. Take a break for about five minutes. Trust me. <laughs> Whosoever is everybody, anybody, everyone, him, her, them, they, those, me, you, us, ourselves, themselves, you and <laughs> Y'all. If you think we talk funny down here, friend, you ought to listen to yourself. <laughs> you and y'all, us and we, we and you skies. <laughs> you guys, all, each person, that individual, all the people, kids, adolescents, old folks, young folks, city slickers, farm boys, homeboys, hamburger flippers, ice cream dippers, teeter totter riders, fearless skydivers, short order cooks, and collectors of books. I want you to listen. This is important, friend, because there's people out there that feel so lonely. No one loves them. They're just going to go eat worms. But I want to tell you right now, friend, <laughs> there's somebody in this audience tonight. They work at Crystal Hamburger, the, the midnight, the graveyard shift, and all they do all night is flip those little square burgers. They think nobody cares about them. But I'm telling you tonight, friend, teeter-totter riders, fearless skydivers, short order cooks, that's you, Bubba and collectors of books, smart people that teach and mooches that leech, Michiganders from Kalamazoo and citizens of Timbuktu, butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, we're not finished. I promise you, by the time I finish this, everyone in this room will have been covered. You can be big, small, tall, short, fat, full-headed, gray-headed, ball-headed, headed for ball-headed. <laughs> big bone, medium bone, small bone, blonde hair, black hair, red hair, green hair, gross hair, red, yellow, black, or white, you are precious in his sight. Did God give you all that? Yes, he did. You can be sort of bad, sort of real bad, really bad, bad, bad as a batter, king of bad. You can, be, you can live uptown, downtown, out of town, suburbs, big house, small house, no house, jail house, little house on the prairie, penthouse in Pittsburgh, or days in in downtown Dayton. You can... 
See that? Man just realized he could be saved. You can play the banjo or be named Joe and play in a band. You can be so smart you can say the ABCs backward or be so backward you never learn the ABCs. You can hold the Guinness Book of World Records for eating the most live slugs or have a collection of the world's most colorful bugs. You can be visiting the revival like everybody oughta or come walking off the streets from Boston just to get a drink of water. You can, you can be patriotic wearing red, white, and blue and be sitting by your friend who's got a big tattoo. You can make your living churning delicious homemade butter or spend every day collecting cans in the city gutter. You can play the guitar and be an international star or be a clown in a circus driving the world's smallest car. You can be the tidiest person this world has ever known or live like a pig with garbage in your home. I visited a lady one time, friend. I went over to her house. My wife went with me. I'll never forget this, friend. We tried, the phone was ringing. We tried to find the phone, friend. <laughs> no! Everything was under two and three feet of just stuff. I mean, you just peel off layers off of the couch, dig deep, and you'd come across a bug-infested hamburger. Then you just toss that up and Fritos and no telling what was under the cushion. <laughs> we finally found the phone. Hmm. You can be the tidiest person this world has ever known or live like a pig with garbage in your home. You can keep up with the Joneses or be the Joneses housekeeper or maybe the coolest dude in school with the largest fluorescent beeper. You can be a shepherd from the hills or a pusher of pills, a wise man from afar or a soap opera star. You can be a Methodist from Montana or a Jew from Japan, be a vegetarian from Virginia or a connoisseur of spam. You can come from... You can come from Texas in a Lexus. Y'all got a Lexus? I said, you got a, you got a Lexus? He goes, yes, by faith. <laughs> you can come from Texas in a Lexus with spurs on your heels or be a fly fisherman from Frankfurt with 15 shiny reels. You can be a snot from the south, a nerd from the north, look like a beast from the east, or be the best of the west. You can be the pastor. You can be, a, you can be the pastor in a revival laying on the floor or a scared deacon from Denver running out the door. You can smell like Chanel and live like a queen or make your abode on an alley wearing tattered Levi jeans. You can drive a BMW and wear flashy Italian suits or ride an Appaloosa and sport pointed cowboy boots. It doesn't make a difference if you're happy or you're blue. Just call upon the Lord, whosoever that's you. <laughs> Glory, everybody. Jesus wants to get a hold of your life, friend. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. We have millionaires come to this altar, and we have people that ain't got a nickel to their name come to this altar. God loves everybody. We've had Buddhists saved. We've had Muslims saved, Jews saved. You name it, friend. They come down to these altars, give their lives to Christ. So don't say this. Just don't come any closer to Jesus concerning your salvation experience. Now it's going to get heavy. Some of you say don't come any closer when it comes to dealing with sin in your life. Don't come any closer, the rich young ruler said, Jesus, I'm a good man, good man, good man, good man, good man, good man. Ow! When Jesus hit the bullseye. He said, get, get all your riches, man. Collect them all, sell them, give it all to the poor and come follow me. Paul was getting to Agrippa. Paul was getting to Felix. He was getting to these folks, friend, and he was dealing with sin. He was preaching righteousness, holiness, the judgment to come, and it started bothering these guys. He was dealing with the sin in their lives. How many times, my friend, has God spoken to you about a certain sin and you refuse to give in? You refuse to allow the Holy One of Israel freedom to enter that parcel of land and pull up from the roots 
those destructive weeds. You choose to allow that sin to remain. And for many of you, it has resulted in an overgrown, weed-choking, non-fruit-producing garden. How many times has God tried to deal with that sin, but you said, this far, Lord, and no further. Don't you come any closer. Well, let me give you an illustration of it, friend. Here's what we do. We come to Jesus. We have our little deck of cards. I watch it night after night. We can't handle it anymore. I need you, Jesus. I need your help. I'm distraught. And you hold up emotional stress. You say, Jesus, look at my emotions. I'm coming apart at the seams. My family's in shambles. Help me, Jesus. Who wouldn't want help with their emotional stress? I'm tired of Prozac. I'm tired of Valium. I want help, Jesus. I lay it down. Oh, take my emotional stress, dear Lamb of God. Take it, Jesus. You lay it down. Then you go, and Lord, you know my son, he doesn't want anything to do with me. He's on drugs. He's away from God. Lord, my family problems are too much to bear. It's all part of my emotional stress. Please, Jesus, take my family. Heal my family. I'm talking about God dealing with sins in your life. You lay it down. You go, oh, God, I give you my family. Well, Jesus, tell you what, I got I to gotta, I gotta pour my heart out tonight. You know, one of the reasons I'm so emotionally distraught and you know, one of the reasons I got family problems is because of my drinking and drug addiction. Jesus, I lay this down too. Take it away, Lord. Take away my problems tonight, Jesus. I don't want to do drugs. I'm sick of crack cocaine. I'm sick of alcohol. I'm sick of morphine. I'm sick of pills. Take it. I don't want to smoke another joint, Jesus. I want to be free. You lay it all down and the Lord sees it. But he's got a searchlight getting closer to you. You've covered all these major things. You've come to Jesus with all these major problems you have. But see, you're holding some stuff behind your back. This happens all over America every Sunday. They lay all this down, they squall and ball at the altar. It's horrible. Look what I'm going through, Jesus. Help me, help me, help me. And we all wonder why they get up and there's no change in their lives. It's because they got some cards behind their back. They're saying, Jesus, you can come this close. Take care of all this. He wants to go a little bit deeper, friend. See, what he wants to deal with, and he'll nail you tonight in this revival, friend. It's all or nothing. You know that, don't you? He'll nail you. He sees that lust and pornography problem behind your back. Oh, you want healing from drug and alcohol addiction. You want your family problems to be taken care of. You don't want no more emotional stress, but the Lord's watching what you do behind closed doors. And he's going, son, the reason you got family problems, the reason your marriage is on the rocks is because you're watching other women on that tube. Your eyeballs are off your little lady that I gave you and they're on some other woman you don't even know. That's your problem, son. That's one of the major problems. You're having family problems. When was the last time you bought your wife some roses? When was the last time you took her out just for an evening, just you and her? No, you'd rather sit and watch some other woman on the screen. Here's one of the problems you have, sir. Your lust, your porno pornography problem. Boy, it gets quiet. You know that? <laughs> Listen up in the other overflow rooms. Read this card. Read it well at home. Maybe that's why you're sitting at home, because one day a preacher talked about lust and you couldn't handle it, so you're never going back to church again. Let me tell you something, friend. God will never do a work in your life unless it's a total work. A total work. He deals with everything. He sees the card behind your back. He wants them all. He wants them all. It's not a partial salvation. It's not a partial deliverance. It's the whole ball of wax. Is this making sense to anybody but me? I hope it's making sense, friend. We say don't come any closer. Don't get any closer. Some of you men, some of you women, I want you to listen to this when the Lord sees this, and it's an abomination in his eyes. Your proud and haughty spirit. Who do you think you are? You're proud. You're puffed up. You think you're somebody. And you pour all this other stuff out to Jesus. Heal me, heal me, heal me. And you hold this thing back right here. It's behind your back. And the Lord said, hey, buddy, unless you humble yourself like a little child, 
I'm never going to be able to do anything in your life. Who do you think you are? Macho man running the family with an iron fist. When are you going to get on your face in front of your kids and repent, ask them to forgive you? I want to challenge some of you fathers and mothers. When you blow it, when you blow it and you know you did something wrong, I don't want any show of hands, but have you ever gotten on your knees in front of your kids and said, forgive me, when you've blown it? I hope you have. I've had to do that with my children. You know, when you blame them for something that they didn't do, and you accuse them and you didn't, they didn't do it, but you knew that they did it and you found out later they did not do it. Don't just walk up to them saying, sorry, kid. Get on your knees. You're breaking that kid's heart. You're breaking his heart. But sometimes it's this thing right here. It's that haughty spirit, that proud, macho dad thing. How? I'm not going to get on my knees in front of my 12-year-old son. Then don't you ever expect him to get on his knees in front of God because he's watching you. You're Jesus to him. But the Lord is looking at this. He's looking at the proud and haughty spirit, and you're saying, Lord, don't get any closer. Don't get any closer. You've touched the hot button there. Besides that, I'm Italian. And we're all like this. No, I know some sweet Italians, Bubba. I know some humble Italians. I've got red hair. Ain't got nothing to do with nothing, friend. Diet. <laughs> Proud and haughty spirit, the Lord wants it all. Or maybe the Lord looks at you and you got all these other problems you poured out, but he sees that greed thing that you got going. Yeah. Greed. I want, I want to gotta get, gotta get, gotta get more, gotta get more. Never satisfied. Never happy. One of the reasons that I love my wife so much not just because she's the most beautiful girl in the world, but I love her because she's never been wrapped up in this junk right here. She never cares. I can take her to a dress shop where they sell dresses just coming out your ears, and if it's not something absolutely she needs, she won't even, she won't even glance at them. And oftentimes we'll go to the mall and we'll go, we'll go shopping and just look around, we'll come out with nothing. Why? She's not into it, friend. She's not into greed. She's not into keeping up with the Joneses. She's not, making, she's not into making sure everybody else notices her. She's not into this greed thing, I got to get, I got to get, I got to get. When we lived in Argentina and the economy went out the roof and suddenly a bag of cement went from $3 to $13 a bag. Hector Ferreira, where you at, buddy? Hector is here with me. We were building a church. We built 13 churches down there. And one of this was a 3,000-seat sanctuary we were building down by the Andes Mountains. And I was broke, man. I was so broke. Just John Kilpatrick used to help me all the time. I'd call him years ago, ask him for finances. He'd always send me five grand, eight grand, three grand. Always helped me. Never turned me down, brother, ever. He always helped me. But there was times where the bag of cement went from $3 to $13 in one day. That's inflation. It got so bad, people were throwing bricks through the grocery store windows, busting through the whole window, bringing their family inside the grocery store and eating. Their whole family would just eat inside that grocery store. And then the police would come, arrest them all, and the man would look at the police and say, at least we ate. It was serious in Argentina. And during that time, my wife and I went into debt, serious personal debt. We went $25,000 in debt. We filled up every credit card. We took out loans from family. What for? To build, put a roof on a church. To put a roof on a church. And I remember turning to my wife. She never, ever got on my case for spending money on God's work. Even to the place of going in debt. Going in debt to put a roof on a church. She was always there. There's never a greed problem. She never said, Steve, we could go to Acapulco. Steve, we could buy a boat. We could buy a new car. What are you doing with that money? She's always give, give, give. Friends, some of you are so hung up on this right here. Money owns you. I don't want your money. That's not what it's about, friend. You give it to the, in the offering, God, God bless you. It's wonderful. But it ain't about that. It's about freedom. It's about what owns you. That's what it's about. But if that could be sitting behind your back like this and the Lord's looking at you going, son, you want me to work all these miracles in you, but you're the greediest man on the face of the earth. For you to come off a $10 bill is like a major sacrifice for you. Yet you'll walk into some store and spend $572 on a few new golf clubs. Shh. 
Well, does that make sense? In dealing with sin in your life, you're saying, don't come any closer, Jesus. I want to tell you, friend, the only way it works with the Lord is this. He'll take all your cards, all of them, every one, and he'll give you one back in return. And it's called Savior and Lord. Every one of yours for one of his. Every one of yours for one of his. Savior and Lord. That's how it works. And for those of you that are struggling with Jesus, part of the reason is you haven't turned it all over. Well, don't come any closer, Jesus, concerning his perfect plan for your life. Write it down, friend. There's a lot of folks in this place that have missed it. Don't come any closer. I want you as Savior, Jesus, but don't you call me into the ministry. I want you as Savior, but I'm going to marry this girl that I've been dating for a year, Jesus. And he's going to you. You feel it in your spirit that she's not the right one. The Lord is telling you, but she's a knockout. She's a fox. You want to marry that girl. She's everything you wanted in a sex pot. She's what you want. And God's looking at you going, she's not the girl for you. I've called you into the ministry. She's going to drag you into the pits of hell. She'll fight you everywhere you go. Everything that you want to do for me, she'll fight you tooth and nail. When I call you to the mission field, she'll say, I ain't going nowhere unless it's a metropolitan city. I want to live in the nicest neighborhood. I want to drive a nice new car. She won't let you do a thing, friend. Why? You're not turning it over, friend. You're saying, Jesus, don't come any closer concerning my relationship with this little lady. You can have the rest of my life, but I'm going to marry her. You're going to marry a devil, friend. You better make sure the lady you're dating is more on fire for God than you are. She better be so turned on to Jesus. And I'm not talking just when you're around her. I'm talking about when you call her house, she can't come to the phone. Why? Because her mama says she's in the back room praying. She's been praying for a couple hours. She's going after God. Why? Because somebody can see her? No, she's alone. She has a relationship with Jesus. That's the kind of woman you want to marry. You want to marry the kind of woman that will come down to these altars and weep and pray and has a burden for souls. Don't come any closer concerning his perfect plan for your life. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for getting the sin out of my life. Thank you, Lord, for all you're doing. But you can stop right here. Stop right here, Jesus. I'll take it from here. No, friend, he's got a plan. Everyone look this way. He has got a plan. Don't you ever turn to Jesus and say, I want all that, but this is my little secret area. It's called my drives, my goals. Friend, there ain't no such thing as that once you become a Christian because you're crucified. You're crucified. You no longer have a life. You belong to Jesus. He calls all the shots. Every one of the shots he calls, friend. I'm going to be open to you, Jesus, as long as you let me marry Sandra. I'm open to you, Jesus, as long as you don't send me to India or Africa or the slums of Nicaragua. I'm open to you, Jesus, as long as your plan fits neatly into my package. It doesn't work like that, Jesus, friend. It doesn't work like that. Is this making sense to anybody? Yeah. It's the Word, friend. It's the Word. I love Saul of Tarsus' conversion. I love it because it's so everything is just right there. He gets hit by the power of God in Acts chapter 9. He falls to the ground. He bites the dust. He's blinded. He speaks into the heavenlies. A voice comes back to him, and the Lord basically tells him, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do, Bubba. It was from that moment on, he was in God's hands. Some of you have gotten saved, but you're still calling all the shots. It doesn't work like that. Young people, I want you to look here. Every one of you young people that are here, I know there's a thousand across the street, but a lot of you in this room. You don't walk up to God and tell God you're going to Harvard. You don't walk up to Jesus and tell Jesus you're going to Florida State. You don't tell Jesus you're going to Pensacola Junior College. You don't tell Jesus you're going to Lee College or the University of Alabama. You don't tell him you're going to Vanderbilt. You don't tell Jesus you're going to be a nurse or a doctor. You don't tell him you're going to be a basketball player. You don't tell him this and tell him that. 
You come up to Jesus, you get on your face, and you say, Lord, what would you have me to do? What do you want me to do? That's how it works. I'll never forget a man in one of our services. A young man came up, this was up in Ohio, came up to me and he was crying his eyes out. And he said, my daddy owns a big business in town. He said, I'm, I was, I've been in Bible school for the last six months, came home on vacation, and my dad said this, he said, son, I will start you off. I will, the kid was 19 years old. I will start you off at $120,000 a year. Brand new home paid for by the business and your own company car if you would leave Bible school and come work in my business. And the kid looked in his dad's face. He said, Daddy, I love you. Ain't no way. He had a call of God on his life. He said, Steve, my dad cut off all the money. He said, I'm down at Southeastern Bible College. I got to make it on my own. I have, to, I have to carry on a night job and put myself through school. And he said, I'm the happiest man on the face of the earth. Why? It's called God's will. It's wonderful, friend, when you're smack dab in the middle of God's will. And I guarantee you something else. If you would do that, sir, if you would do that, ma'am, later on your parents are going to look at you. They're going to be so proud. One of the reasons your dad made it in business is because he fought. And they're going to look at you. You fought for what you believed in. Even to the point of turning down Papa's money. You fought because you knew you were supposed to be a missionary. You knew you were supposed to be in the ministry. And you fought. And they may look at you from afar. But after a while, they're going to go, wow, what a boy. What a girl. She turned everything else down because of the convictions in her heart. Is anyone listening tonight? Yeah. Don't come any closer, Jesus. Now, I know everyone in this place is not called into the ministry. Don't you dare say that I'm saying that. A lot of you are called into the secular world. God's calling you to be a dentist. God's calling you to be a teacher. God's calling you to be a maintenance engineer in some building project. Whatever it might be, just remember, it's a mission field. It's all a mission field. Let me tell you something else. IBM doesn't pay your wages. God does. Every dime that ever comes in, Every nickel that ever comes in, God did that. See, you don't receive a living. You don't earn a living. You receive a living. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things are added unto you. So when you get that job, it's a God job. When you get that raise, it's a God raise. When you get that paycheck, hold it up in the air before you go to that bank and say, thank you, Jesus. Your boss, I don't care whose signature is on that thing, friend. God gave you that money. Glory. Well... I'm going to close in just a little bit. Charity, act like you're getting ready to get up. If you don't do this, I've got a couple more points, but I'm not going to share them. I want to share this one last one here. If you do not do this, if you keep saying to God, don't come any closer, there's going to come a day when you will wish you had said to him, come all the way in. There's coming a day you will wish that you would have come forward at the Brownsville Assembly of God altar call on that Thursday night in July. There's coming a day where you wish you had God, you had allowed God freedom to deal with the sin in your life. You would have wished that you'd given God every single last one of your cards. There's coming a day, friend. You would give anything for one last chance for him to fulfill his plan for your life. But there's coming a day, friend, the Lord is going to say this. It's going to be judgment day. You're going to stand before him, and you're going to wish that you could get just a little bit closer to the Savior. You're going to look into his eyes, and you're going to see that love. You're going to see his hands. You're going to see the, 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 the prints on his hands, the prints on his feet, and you're going to want to embrace him, but the Lord's going to say, don't come any closer. Don't come any closer. All your life, you held back. And this is what you get as a result. Depart from me. I never knew you. But Jesus, you know where I attended church. I was there faithful every Sunday. I worked in children's church. I handmade half those puppets. 
Depart from me, I never knew you. We never fellowshiped. You did everything on your own. Sure, you worked in children's church making those puppets, but don't you remember when you were 16 years old when I called you to the mission field at, at, at youth camp? You remember that call. And instead of going to the mission field, you decided to work in church and work in the children's church. But I spoke to you, and the devil sidetracked you and put you in some ministry to where you could tickle that little itch that you had called missions. Our churches are full of people like this, friend. Boy, it gets quiet sometimes in this place. Well, how do I know if I'm called to the mission field? You got to be called not to go. Keith Green used to say that. That means you need to stand before God. Everyone in this room, you stand before God and just take a map, take a globe, wrap your arm around that globe and say, whatever you want, Jesus. I don't, I don't, it doesn't make any difference. You're making $600,000 a year, friend. Put your arm around that globe and say, Jesus, listen, I'm 52 years old. I've got two kids. They've graduated from school. My wife and I were free as birds. We got a little in the savings, but that doesn't matter. I'll give that away, Jesus. I don't care no more. My arm's around this globe. If you want to call me to the mission field, we'll go anywhere. We'll paddle a kayak down, down, down the Amazon. I don't care. Whatever you want us to do, if you have an attitude like that, friend, God might be merciful to you. But if you're like this, don't you even, I don't even want to look at a map, Jesus. And I'm never going to another mission service. I hate it when those missionaries stand up there and talk like that. They make me feel horrible. Friend, you're saying, Jesus, don't come any closer. Don't come any closer. You need to have your arms down going, Jesus, take me. Do whatever you want. I personally believe, now my theology may be bad on this, but I personally believe the rich young ruler, I believe he had turned to Jesus and said, hey, that's cool. It's all yours. Whatever you want to do with it. The poor, I don't care. I don't think Jesus would have said, hurry up, guys, sell all that stuff, give it to the poor. I think he was looking for his heart. I personally believe that. I personally believe that. I believe if that man had said, hey, Jesus, listen, no problem. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. You can have all the worldly riches. I think Jesus would have looked at him and turned to Peter and John said, now that's a man of God right there. I think he would have said, you know, hold on to your riches. You've done good with those things, and you're not, you're not stingy. Hold on to them. We might use them in the mission work. Go ahead and live in that nice house. Ride that, that, that Class A donkey, you know. <laughs> Whoo! Don't come any closer. Some of you in this room and in the other rooms, and those of you at home, that you spend most of your life on self. If God would do anything in your life tonight, friend, to turn that around and you spend most of your life on God things, on thinking about God, thinking about Him, what would He have you to do? when you wake up one morning and go off to work and it becomes a mission field rather than a place to make money. Your life would change, friend. It would be marvelous to go to work going, Jesus, is there anyone sick I can pray for today? Is it, who is it at work today that needs me, Jesus? Who is it that needs me? I was at Walmart the other day, and some of y'all go too far with evangelism, but this was hilarious. I was at Walmart the other day, and a Christian was working at Walmart, had the Walmart gown on and little badge and was preaching the gospel to a customer, man. I'm talking, rah, 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 rah. then I come walking by. He goes, there he is. Come here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked up to him. He goes, tell him the way it is, man. This is the evangelist of Brownsville Revival. He'll tell you just exactly what I'm talking about. I'm no, no, no. The lady was trying to buy some paint or something, you know, but so be a little bit more graceful, tactful, friend. But God will use you where you're at. He will use you where you're at. Whew. Friend, he's called you to his side for a purpose. Don't you ever hold up your hands and say, Jesus, don't come any closer concerning this sin in my life. 
Tonight you drop your hand, sir. I can see you at home. As a matter of fact, I see a man sitting and you've got a tan coffee mug in your hand. It's a beige coffee mug. It's just sitting there. Matter of fact, the coffee's cold. You've just been spellbound of that thing and it's gotten cold. Just sitting there with that cup. Friend, I'm going to tell you something right now. God has put you right in front of that screen. He's telling you right now, give it all up. Get the sin out of your life. Come clean. Come clean. Don't ever say to Jesus, don't come any further. You say to Jesus, you can come as far as you want. Get as close as you want, Jesus. Consume me. Shine that searchlight in my heart. Take away the sin. Take away the filth. Take away the hatred. Take away the greed. Get everything out of me, Jesus. Have your way in my life. Everyone stand, if you would. Those of you at the chairs, move them to the left and the right. Charity, come join me. Glory. A lot of heads started dropping about halfway through this message. He's speaking to you, friend. He's speaking to you. I often wonder what would have happened if Agrippa had said, Paul, you've been persuading me to become a Christian. Would you pray with me? I often thought about scriptures like that. If, if just he'd said, Paul, that is awesome, man. Instead of putting his hands up, he'd gone, Paul, would you pray with me? I want to become a Christian too. If Felix, rather than, and Drusilla, his wife, rather than turning Paul off, had said, Paul, you've convicted our hearts. We're in sin. And both of them got on their knees and said, Paul, we want Jesus to wash the sin away from our lives. They took their hands down and said, Jesus, come all the way in. Come all the way in. What would have happened if the rich young ruler said, Jesus, take it all. Take it all. Friend, don't be guilty of saying, don't come any closer, Jesus. Don't come any closer. There should not be one barrier between you and Jesus. Nothing between you and the Lord. Hmm. Well, we sing that song, Have Your Own Way. Have your way, Lord. Do we really mean that, friend? I'm going to give an altar call right now. Everyone look this way. I could probably do it without saying these statements, but I'm going to do it for clarification. Everyone in this room that is backslid, you're away from God, I want you to listen to me. Everyone, listen. At one time in your life, you were on fire for God. At one time in your life, you were excited about the things of God. At one time in your life, you were consumed with God. But now you've grown cold. You've come, become dry. At one time, you were like a well-fertile, watered garden. But now you're like the desert sand when it comes to spiritual things. You're backslidden. At one time, friend, you were so on fire for God, the littlest thing used to bother you. You would walk into a, 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 a mall and go into a Magnavox television shop and you'd look up and a TV program would be on and how they do in those department stores and all these shows would be on, the same show as on all these screens. And, and then, then you'd be watching it and suddenly someone started slipping their blouse off on this program. There was a time you would have looked at that and just turned your head in disgust. Why? Because you had Jesus living in you. You didn't want anything to do with the world and the lust of the flesh. Or your son, your teenage son would rent a movie and he'd plug it in and all of a sudden they'd start saying, GD this and GD that. And you'd say, son, get that film out of that box. It was an abomination to you why you were on fire for God. But now you're backslidden and you find yourself sitting on that couch, sitting in that lazy boy watching that garbage, watching that filth. Friend, you're backslid. That is something Jesus would never do, and that's what sin is. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. 
You find yourself with some of these sins that I mentioned tonight, the greed, the haughty spirit. The Bible says, friend, that he will not look on a proud man. The Bible says God resists the proud. But tonight you're proud. You're a proud man. You're a proud young man, a proud lady. You're arrogant. You're snotty to be around. You think you're somebody. Let me tell you something, princess. You might be a good-looking gal and everybody's staring at you at school, but just don't you forget who formed you in your mama's womb. He's the one that smacked that nose in the middle of your face. And maybe when you were in there, it had a huge old wart on the side of it inside your mama's womb, but the Lord said, no, I think I'm going to make her a beauty queen, and he took that wart off. Maybe you're going to have some type of deformity, but God said, no, I think I'll make her just about perfect. And you come out, and now you're 14 years old, and everybody's staring at you. Your body's forming, and all the guys want to get a hold of you, and you think you're a hotshot little gal. Friend, you need to get on your face and say, Jesus, thank you for every fingernail. Thank you that I have eyelashes. Thank you, Jesus, that my eyes are not blinded. Thank you, Jesus, that I can walk, I can talk, I can breathe. I can Thank you, Lord, that I can think. Thank you, Lord, that my brain is functioning. Thank you, Jesus, that I can walk. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that I can clap. I can worship. Get that proud, haughty spirit out of you, man. Get it out. Those of you that are backslidden, the Lord is going to get a hold of your life in just a minute. You're already under conviction, but I'm going to give this altar call. You're going to come. This is any of you that have any sin in your life. Anything that Jesus wouldn't do, you're going to get it out quickly. He's doing a work at these altars, friend, that's phenomenal. He's taken sin away from people that have struggled with it for years. It's amazing what's happening. There's something going on at these altars, friend. Those of you in this room that are religious, tonight Jesus is telling you to come all the way in, but some of you are going, no, don't come any closer. Don't you mess with my religion. Someone said to me a few minutes ago, religion is a personal thing. I'm telling you it ain't. Never has been. Well, it's just my personal thing. That's just my personal belief. Well, tell that to Jesus who hung naked on the cross. If it was a personal, private thing, he would have been crucified in some cave somewhere. But it wasn't a personal, private thing. It was a public thing. Publicly nude, publicly naked, publicly beaten, publicly whipped for you. But you're, it's a religious thing for you. It's a private thing for you. And you don't want anyone to really, a man's religion is a personal thing. That's a bunch of hogwash, friend. Never has been. So I want to talk to you about your religion just for a second. Religion is man's attempt to find God. Christianity is God's successful attempt to find man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That worked. He came down, but now all over America we have these religions that are trying to find him. You ever notice how many are cropping up all over America every new day? Pick a week, any week, flip open any magazine, there's some new cult that moved into town. Some new guru has come to town with some new teaching. There's nothing new under the sun, friend. But there's a man that came 2,000 years ago, friend, that sealed it. He came 2,000 years ago and he said this, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. There is only one way to the Father. And he didn't say that there are other options. He didn't say you could get there another way. He didn't say you could join the Methodist church and get into heaven. He didn't say you could be the founding member of First Baptist and make it to heaven. He didn't say you could be the head usher at Brownsville Assembly of God and make it to heaven. He didn't say you could be the evangelist that preaches at the Brownsville Revival and make it to heaven. He didn't say you could be the most honored pastor in America, John Kilpatrick, and make it to heaven. None of that matters, friend. But for some of you, you have all these little ways and means to get to heaven. I do this. I do that. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm a little bit better than her. I do this in church. I do that. That's all hogwash, friend. It's all religion. It's all religion. You can go to hell with baptismal waters all over your face. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. 
You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell and be the founding member of the largest church in the city if you don't know Jesus. There's only one membership card in heaven. There's only one that you'll find in God's archives, and it's blood red. You've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way in. It's always been like that, and it always will be like that. One way in. But you're religious. You look good. You talk good. You walk right. You smell right. You dress right. But you're not right. You don't know him. An 80-year-old woman came up to me one night in the back, and she's crying her eyes out, and she said this to me, and I'm saying it to you as a testimony from her. She said, I've been in church all my life, and I have never known Jesus. Is it too late for me? And boy, that's a, that was a word for America. That was a word for America. America has been in church. They go to church, but they don't know Jesus. She said, is it too late? And I said, ma'am, it's not too late. You're breathing. And I said, pray with me. And she prayed, and I watched that 80-year-old woman pray the sinner's prayer. Just a few months later, right over here, a 91-year-old man, 91 years old, got saved for the first time in his life. Glory. Hallelujah. 91. Then he comes up to me afterwards and he slips Mike Brown a little can of snuff. And he said, I don't need this anymore. <laughs> 91, getting the sin out of your life. That's cool. You know, some people feel like they're that old. They just got the right to sin. You know, I've been, I've been around, been there, done that. I deserve a can of snuff. No, sir. Get it out. That night, he was going, Jesus, come all the way in. He wasn't going, oop, I'll take your salvation. You can't have my snuff. <laughs> I'm keeping my snuff. <laughs> no, friend. Jesus said, I want your snuff. <laughs> I want your snuff, Bubba. Give me your snuff. Well, you're religious, but you don't know the Lord. This will probably irritate some of you, but I'm telling you right now, if you're not on fire for Jesus, then I question your salvation. You can get mad at me if you want. You can hate me, friend, but take it before the Lord. Stand before the Father. Stand before God. Go to your secret closet and stand there and say, that preacher told me I was supposed to be in love with your son, Jesus. That preacher told me I was supposed to be thinking about your son all the time. That preacher told me that I was supposed to be on fire for Jesus. Think about that, friend. What do you think the father's going to say? Who was that preacher? Where did he come from? What kind of garbage is that? I don't think so, friend. I think he's going to say, well, did you not read in the scripture if you're lukewarm? He'll spew you out of his mouth. So, friend, there's only one temperature, and it's hot. Hot. So if you're not, if you're not on fire for the Lord, friend, I question your salvation. Take it up with God tonight. You need to get on fire for God to get the sin out. There's another group of people in this place that you've never known the Lord. You've never known Jesus. I'm telling you tonight, friend, he is wonderful. Some of you depend on the psychics. You call the psychics for counsel. Don't raise your hand, but how many have done that? Don't raise your hand. If any man seek the psychics, he's the same person. All things remain the same. Behold, his phone bill becomes new. <laughs> That's not scripture, but it's truth. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away. Behold, all things are become new. You need... Tonight, friend, you need to meet the King of kings and Lord of lords. Some of you stare at the stars and just study all those constellations and, and read them and you map them out, and, and what a waste. I mean, I love the stars. They're beautiful out there, but I know the one who made them. I love some of you spend your whole life studying butterflies and, and bed bugs and, and 
Big beetles. The other day I saw a beetle. I've never seen a beetle so colorful in all my life. They're everywhere, all over our lawn, these big, colorful beetles. They're marvelous. But I don't look at them and go, oh, dear God, a new species, and get down on my knees and pick up that beetle. I mean, that's wonderful. That's what you study for life, and you make a living studying bugs. But make sure you meet the one who made the bug. Make sure you know the one who made the bug, friend. Don't spend your whole life skirting the issue going around and around and around. Get the one who made it all, friend. You can study the intricate details of a butterfly and then miss the creator of the butterfly. So tonight, if you don't know Jesus, or you're a witch, a warlock, whoever you might be, whatever cult you might be from, or if you've never had a stick of religion in your life, you're just a, just, when it comes to God, he's never had a place anywhere. Tonight, if you'll come down to this altar, he will save your soul. He will turn you around. He'll make you brand new. He'll come into your life. Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. Undeserved forgiveness. Some of you need to listen to this. Everyone look this way. We're closing. One day, my children, and I'm going to close with this story. We're going to give the altar call. My children had done something wrong, my little boy and my little girl. We believe the scriptures spare the rod, spoil the child. They had disobeyed a rule several times. They had disobeyed it, and their, their mercy was up, okay? It was time to get a little licking. And so they, I called them into the bedroom, and they came in, and, and, and I had on shorts that day, and, and I told them both to bend over the bed, and, and I was going to give them a spanking, and they both bent over, and I pulled my belt off, and, and they were just sitting there, and they, they, they both got finished saying, you know, they, they said, I love you, Daddy, I love you, Daddy. And you know, I said, I love you too, bend over, you know, and you know how it is. And... Uh, and when they were bent over facing down on the bed and they knew they were going to get a spanking for what they did, I, I took my belt and rather than spank my kids, which I believe in godly punishment, never out of anger, but it's godly punishment, I took my belt and began beating my leg and I began whipping my leg as hard as I could. And as soon as I started hitting my leg and they realized it wasn't their rear ends, they turned around and watched me and I kept lifting it higher and higher and higher and it would pop my leg and my leg, my, all up and down my leg began to swell and turn red and welts began to form. And as I watched the impact it was having on my kids, I kept beating myself harder and harder and harder and harder and harder till they screamed out, Daddy, stop! Stop, Daddy! No! No, Daddy, no, Daddy, stop, stop, don't do it anymore, Daddy. And finally, after about 45 seconds to a minute, I stopped. And they looked at my leg. It was just beaten red from being beaten. And I looked at my kids, and I said, let me tell you what Daddy just did. You were going to get a spanking for what you did wrong, and it was going to be nothing like what I took. You were going to get a spanking for what you did wrong, but Daddy took that spanking instead. Ryan, Shelby, don't you ever forget that Jesus, 2,000 years ago, took your spanking. He was beaten. He was whipped. He didn't ever deserve that punishment. Nails went through his hand, through his feet. He was spat upon. A plow was raked down his back. The flesh was just torn open. Muscle and, and, and blood vessels were punctured and and then a beam was placed on his back and he dragged it up to Calvary's hill. Nails pierced his hands, his feet. And they, they were still crying. And boy, they, they, to this day, my kids both remember that. I said, Jesus paid the price for you just like Daddy just said, took your punishment. I love both of you. And I gave them both a hug. And I said, you don't have to get a whipping today. Daddy took your whipping. I want to tell everybody here, Jesus took your whipping for everything you've ever done wrong, every adulterous affair, every marijuana reefer you stuck in your mouth, every crack cocaine you smoked, everything you've ever done wrong, every time you've cursed, every pornographic picture you've ever watched, he died on Calvary 2,000 years ago for you. For everything you've done wrong, when are you going to receive him as Savior? When are you going to get down on your face and receive him as Savior? When Charity sings, run to the mercy seat. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. You're going to come as quickly as you can, and the only thing that will keep you back tonight is pride. And I've already covered it. Pride. 
That's that arrogant spirit that says, what will my brother think? What will my girlfriend think? What will my mother think? Who cares what anybody thinks anymore, friend? If there's sin in your life, you're going to come quickly. Do not hesitate. Do not wait right now. Everyone who needs forgiveness, everyone who's away from God, hurry. Come on, get on your face before the Lord. Hurry. Come on. Come on right now. I need the Lord. I need forgiveness in the balcony. Let's go. In the chapel. In the cafeteria. Let's go. Hurry. 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 Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. He said that I can come to his presence when I'm here. And to the holy place when most they Cafeteria, let's go. In the choir room, let's go. In the Sunday school rooms, let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Who are you waiting for? Who are you waiting for? Don't come any closer, you say. Don't come any closer. Well, he's here, friend. He's going to forgive you. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. But what are you waiting on, friend? Get on your knees. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to wash you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to make you new. He'll heal you. He'll heal your backsliding. He'll take away the drugs. He'll take away the alcoholism. He'll heal your body. Come on right now. Get on your face. Come on. Come on. Hurry. 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 Come on. Yes. choir room those of you at home Lendl's going to sing this song a couple times through and I'm closing this altar call friend you got about 60 seconds to come down and get right why do I have to go down there brother Steve why not what's your problem is it pride didn't you listen tonight what pride will do shake it loose friend break away Jesus went to Calvary for you can't you walk 75 feet for him come on 
Come on. Lord, have mercy. Hurry, come on. Come on. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to wait about 30 seconds for that man that's struggling right now. Intercessors, if you've ever prayed. Those of you that's all to repent, ask the Lord to wash you, to cleanse you. Don't anyone leave at the altar. Stay right where you're at. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. What are you struggling with? Shake it loose. Shake it loose in the cafeteria. Let's go in the balcony. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Come on. God bless you, sir. Yes, God bless you. Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hurry. 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 Woo. He's here. God bless you, son. God bless you. Get it out of your life tonight, friend. Don't leave this place the way you came in. Come on. Come on. This is music in God's ears. This is why he died. This is what every awakening in America has heard. Repentance. Hurry. Hurry. You've got 15 seconds, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, God bless you, son, 7, 6, 5, hurry, God bless you, 4, 3, 2, 1. I want everyone at this altar to pray with me out loud. If there's ever been a time not to mumble a prayer, it's right now. You need to vocalize this, friend. You're going to be saying tonight to Jesus, come all the way in. You're going to drop your hands. You're not going to say, don't come any closer. You're going to say, Jesus, come as close as you want. Right now, I want everyone at the altar to pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, Jesus, for not leaving me alone. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son that I might have life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to me about my sin. And thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood that I might have life. I ask you tonight, sweet Jesus, to forgive me. I have sinned. I have hurt you. I've hurt others, and I've hurt myself. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me clean. Make me new. I repent of my sin. I ask you tonight to come close, real close. Be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. 
I give myself to you. Come live your life through me. From now on, Jesus, come close in every area of my life. I will never hold anything back from you. In your precious name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Want everyone at this altar. Want everyone at the altar.